Hi, and welcome back to Health Communication. Today we're going to be covering Chapter 8 on Mass Communication and Health. Uh, as usual, it's a huge chapter and I have a hard time condensing all the material, so I'm going to try to focus on just four main topics. Uh, we're going to talk about cultivation theory first, and then we're going to talk about direct-to-consumer direct advertising, and then I want to talk about some effects that are um, usually more specific to news media, uh, which is agenda setting and framing. Um, so let's just start off um, and talk about really like the overarching theme here, which is mass communication. Um, most of the stuff we're talking about today isn't limited to just health issues. It's, it's their theories and perspectives and um, even with the direct-to-consumer advertising, like advertising, um, something that applies to all of the media messages we get. Um, but of course, we're going to be talking about its implications for health. But mass communication, you'll notice isn't talking about the type of types of things we were talking about with like technology and social media and those things. Mass communication is a specific type of communication when you have um, one message that's distributed to many. And oftentimes the many, the audience who receives that message, can't respond back. A great example um, is television, newspaper, radio, right? These are all mass communication mediums where somebody can distribute a message very widely, um, but really only like one person or maybe a few, right, have control over that message uh, and the audience can't really respond back. Um, but the point is, of course, these messages are going out to a lot of people. Um, cultivation theory, which is the first thing that your chapter discusses, I would argue is probably um, one of the most well-known possibly even among the most researched theories of mass communication influence. Cultivation theory is focusing on how the media can cultivate or um, normalize different perceptions. Um, and basically the, the main premise is that um, people who have very high exposure to the media, um, and actually cultivation theory was developed in response, um, or not really in response to, but was developed uh, looking at television users um, because people we're consuming a lot of television. Uh, so Gerbner, the guy who came up with this, um, started theorizing that you know people who were exposed to a lot of television media would eventually develop perceptions that actually matched what they were seeing on television better than what's actually happening in the real world. Um, so in this way, uh, the television was thought of as something that over time could develop people's perceptions of reality. Um, a good example of this is what uh, Gerbner called mean world perceptions. And the finding was is that people who um, watched a lot of um, television tended to think that the world was a mean and scary place. They tended to overestimate their, um, their likelihood of being involved in a crime. Um, and why is this according to cultivation theory? Well, cultivation theory would say if you did a content analysis, you would see that the way that the world is portrayed on television, local news and dramas, right? It's, it's focusing on a lot of danger and crime. And so people who consume a lot of it would have perceptions that match the reality that was uh, put on television and maybe not even the reality, it would match the reality on television better than it would match actual real life statistics of crime and things like that. Um, you know, it, it's it, I should make this point though because a lot of people misunderstand. Cultivation theory isn't about the effects of one particular TV show. Cultivation theory is about over time the accumulative effect of watching a lot of something. Okay, a lot of television. Um, more recently, instead of looking at um, media as a whole or consuming television as a whole, uh, cultivation theory started to look at specific genres. So, for instance, um, medical dramas. So, some studies would look at um, one that I recall seeing recently looked at how um, medical dramas, people who watched a lot of medical dramas like ER and Grey's Anatomy and those types of things, um, tended to have slightly different perceptions of uh, medical care and slightly different perceptions of treatment than people who didn't consume uh, that genre as heavily. Um, it is important though that cultivation theory does talk about um, different types of effects that can happen. The first is first order effects, which your book describes. Um, actually, oh, I didn't realize, I use a Grey's Anatomy example. Um, this is more like it can cultivate um, different uh, knowledge or information. So uh, the, the example would be that people who watch a lot of medical dramas like Grey's Anatomy would actually come out with um, 
a sense of medical terminology. They might actually have a better vocabulary um, because over time they've sort of picked it up, right? Um, second order effects, though, which relates better to this uh, mean world perception, like I, I mentioned a minute ago, um, is literally talking about the, these per wider perceptions of the medical field, of um, the reality of crime, those types of things. Um, your book's example is also great. Um, it talks about actually how um, people who consume a lot of medical dramas, for instance, might have uh, a greater expectation that biomedical interventions are more effective than things that aren't in the biomedical tradition, right? So this would just be a general perception that's sh shaped over time by watching a lot of medical dramas. Um, I should really point out that another reason I think cultivation theory is very popular and, and people who study uh, the media like I do, we talk about it a lot, is because it's also very controversial. There's no good way to really demonstrate that cultivation theory absolutely happens. Because it could be that people who like medical dramas already have certain perceptions about um, medical realities, and so that's why they watch them to begin with. There's no good way to establish time order of, of these effects, right? It's very difficult. We can't just isolate somebody um, and say, okay, you've never seen television before, start watching it so that we know what they were like before they started watching television and what they were not like. Um, so that's one criticism that comes a, across from this theory. Um, and the other thing I want to point out, it's not really a criticism, but um, there, there's what are called mainstreaming effects, which essentially says that people who have personal experience with something, in addition to seeing it on the media, are actually going to get like kind of a double dose of cultivation. So if I work in the medical field uh, and I have um, certain perceptions based on my personal experiences of working in the medical field and I watch a lot of medical dramas then that, that corroborate what I already believe, then of course I'll have um, even stronger cultivation effects at the end. So. Um, okay, I do want to point out, you, you know, your book actually goes through a lot of different types of things that could be cultivated by the media, also different types of portrayals um, of really kind of, in my opinion, negative <laughs> health behaviors, um, such as um, they talk about, uh, you know, how the media can uh, raise the incidence of substance abuse if we um, see a lot of people abusing alcohol or drugs on television and we start to think of that as being more normative. Or um, they talk about eating disorders, which is a really controversial thing, when we start to think uh, as, a, as a certain body type as being normative. Um, and then, uh, drawing from a theory we've had before, uh, we do social comparison, right? It could uh, lead to unhealthy diet dietary behaviors. Um, do read up on all these examples. I think they're really interesting. But I really I want to highlight, too, to sort of preview things we're going to be talking about later, that in the same way that the media can cultivate inaccurate things or negative things, it can also work to cultivate positive things and um, healthy things. So all the effects we're talking about, including cultivation, uh, can actually be used to have a positive influence on people's health, too. Um, but more on that later. Just want you to think about that. Uh, your book also talks about direct-to-consumer advertising, which I think is fascinating as a topic because it's relatively new, right? Um, it used to be that people went into the doctor's office and were completely reliant on the doctor to tell them about the latest drug or what's out there. But now, right, pharmaceutical companies can go direct to the consumers with their advertisements and tell them all about their new Viagra pill or their new heartburn medication or whatever. Um, and there's a lot of controversy, ar uh, co controversy around these advertisements because they really have changed um, the face of how uh, people interact with their doctors and how people make decisions about their health. Um, and I, I, I don't really have a specific opinion. I think like a lot of advertising, it's kind of a mixed bag. But as your book brings up, right, there's pluses. This could empower patients and give them information that they weren't, um, they weren't aware of. It could actually uh, prompt people to go see a doctor because maybe they didn't think there was any way to fix their problem and this will actually get them into a doctor's office. But of course the downsides are is that people might um, demand medications that aren't right for them. These advertisements also use shady tactics sometimes um, to convince people that they should be on a, a certain medication when maybe they shouldn't be. If you notice um, direct-to-consumer advertisements like to do uh, things like when they're telling you about all the terrible side effects that could come from taking a certain medicine. They always pair it with like um, really relaxing music and they show you pictures of people enjoying their life and having fun, but it's 
considered a little bit unethical. In fact, I'm not even sure how they're allowed to do that anymore because I know there was some legislation passed. But the problem with that, of course, is that it actually sort of makes people overlook potential risks. So it's not just about whether or not there should be direct-to-consumer advertising, but they're a little controversial because we're still trying to work out methods to advertise drugs in a, in a responsible way um, so that people are, are come out more informed, not less informed. Um, Anyway, it's an interesting field um, in health communication. So, okay, um, finally, I just want to um, talk about now some things that are more specific to news media. You know, cultivation theory, for instance, uh, could really apply to news media or fiction media, um, especially if you're looking at television as a whole or newspaper reading as a whole. Um, agenda setting um, is a theory that essentially says that the media sets the public agenda meaning that the news media can affect what issues the public finds important. Now, this is very different than saying that the news media tells people how to think about issues. This is not what agenda setting is. Agenda setting is simply saying that the news media tells people what to think about. And the way they used to study this, this actually came out of political communication. The way that they would study this is they would ask people, what do you think are the top 10 most important issues facing America or whatever? And then they would see what people said and then they could go back and they could actually match it up with what's been featured in the news. And there was usually this very strong correlation between what people thought was the most important thing going on, what people thought was a thing that uh, people needed to, to talk about more or whatever, um, and what had actually been reported on. Again, that's not saying that the media set that tells people what they should think about an issue. It's simply saying that um, if I asked a, a bunch of people today, what's the most important issue? And they responded that Ebola is the most important issue. And then we went back and we did sort of a comparison of what the media is saying. There's a good chance that we're going to find a strong correlation between what the media is reporting and what people think is the most important issue facing America or however you word the question. Um, of course, just like agenda setting, right, there's, I mean, I'm sorry, just like cultivation theory, there's sort of this um, potential feedback loop where we don't really know if the news media is responding to public interest or vice versa. Although I can tell you kind of informally, I haven't read it recently, but there's a lot of research that's been done on journalism practices that does suggest that usually it's the news media that will set this agenda, although the public agenda can feed back into that, right? Um, likewise, sometimes politicians will try to manipulate the media agenda in order to manipulate the public agenda, if that's making any sense. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but I love this stuff so much. Um, interestingly enough, um, I, although I did say this... Uh, applies to news media a lot. Um, campaigns, going back to our conversation about campaigns, a lot of research suggests that campaigns have limited effectiveness when they're actually trying to change people's perception about something. But they actually are very effective as agenda setters. So a campaign that talks about, um, for instance, a, like a, a flu vaccine uh, might not necessarily be, it'll have limited effectiveness at changing people's perceptions about what they whether or not they want to get it or not. Um, but they'll have really strong, it should have a really strong effect on um, agenda setting. It should actually um, bring it into people's conversation, bring it into the top of people's minds so that they're actually thinking about it one way or the other, um, which shouldn't be overlooked because um, as we've talked about with two-step flow, sometimes the, the biggest barrier to media effects is getting people to just talk about it. And agenda setting is perfect for that. If you can get people thinking it's important, then they'll get talking about it and, and we can have stronger effects. So um, finally, uh, the next level, though, of agenda setting is actually influencing what people think about something or how people think about a health issue. Um, and usually the effect that we associate with... Um, with this perception changing effect, I guess you could say, is framing. Uh, we, we talk about how a message is framed. Another way of thinking about framing effects is the spin that the media would put on a particular issue. And actually, this isn't the first time we've talked about it in this class. You might remember that um, when we covered prospect theory and we talked about how um, the same objective information can either be put in terms of a gain frame or a loss frame. So I could say, for instance, that, um, oh, what's a good example? Um, I could say that depending, um, 
that if people, going back to the vaccine thing, um, I could have a headline in my newspaper that says, if people don't get vaccinated, uh, we expect this disease to spread at X number of rate. Um, versus like a headline that says, um, if people do get vaccinated, we expect the disease to, um, you know, dissolve at such a rate or something. I'm sorry, being terrible at the examples. Uh, here's the point I want to make, though. Um, different images that we put with certain articles. So if I had an article talking all about a cure for meningitis, um, but I had like a really graphic image attached to it versus like a really positive image, right? That can also be considered framing because you're actually manipulating information in the news article, even if it's visual, to affect people's perception of that issue. Um, framing can really be anything. Um, there's an interesting, uh, I don't know if you'll remember this, I use it in one of my classes, one of my media classes. There was an interesting time back during the O.J. Simpson uh, controversies where um, Time Magazine and Newsweek both had the same exact image of O.J. Simpson, but one of them was much darker and one of them was much lighter. And one of them had some sort of headline about his guilt and one of them had some um, headline about his innocence. And, and the idea was just that like they're framing the entire issue in a different way. Hi, I'm sorry, I got cut off for a second. Um, my iPhone was plugged in and, and it made the computer go all wonky. Okay, anyway, uh, what I wanted to say was is that, um, well, I tell you what, well, sort of like in here, I, I really just want you to understand the, the differences between agenda setting and framing. And I, I hopefully, you know, for the exam, you would be able to um, maybe explain um, the different examples of how agenda setting could affect people's health or health behavior versus framing. And the, the point I really want you to get from this is both of them do have effects. It's just that agenda setting is kind of um, affecting what's on people's radar, while framing is affecting how they actually think about those issues on their radar. So agenda setting, the book uses the example actually of how in the um, late 80s, the news never reported on HIV AIDS because the news media had decided it really wasn't a very interesting issue to report on because it was only affecting gay men. The news media was wrong. And the problem with that, of course, is that people just weren't aware of HIV AIDS. Heterosexuals weren't. Um, it wasn't on their radar. Um, and that in itself is problematic. But framing, right, ha when they do report on issues, um, framing would say that how they report on HIV AIDS could affect things like people's risk perceptions. Am I at risk for AIDS or is it only a gay man's disease or those types of things, right? Um, so uh, hopefully you see um, the various implications of that. Okay, sorry, I'm like so flustered after that like little blip, but um, I'll see you on the discussion boards. Bye.